We wrap up the last of our three videos on the five parts of the human resource management by looking at performance management systems. So the five aspects of the human resource management is we recruited, we then did training and development, we then looked at benefits and compensation, and then employee relations, including labor unions, and then finally performance management. So here we're looking at behavioral controls. If you contrast that as we look at decisions by managers, we previously looked at financial controls. So how do we make sure that we have the appropriate amount of money to fund the organization? Here we're looking at do we have the appropriate behaviors uh, for the organization to operate? So in behavioral controls, we're looking at establishing performance standards and ways to evaluate that performance. There are different ways to uh, do performance appraisals. So you could have your employees do written essays, write self-reflections, and have them submitted to their boss and have their boss then provide feedback on that. You could have um, an evaluation of your employees in terms of looking, observing their behavior, filling out um, on a scale how they're doing at certain tasks. You could ask them questions and have them rate how they're doing or how they're feeling on particular tasks. There are a number of different performance appraisal methods. Uh, let's talk about one that's the 360 degree appraisal, uh, more popular in the last decade or two. This one here is not just having your boss evaluate your performance, but the idea with a 360 degree appraisal is that not only does your boss evaluate you, but your peers would also give evaluations, your subordinates would give evaluations. I could even have a point where you evaluate yourself through that piece. So all around you, everyone who is involved with working with you uh, would be part of that appraisal process. So there's a number of different ways to evaluate performance and start thinking about how you prefer to have your performance appraised. So what kind of organization do you want to work for? Is it one that is metric based in terms of the number of sales or um, line of number of lines of code that you type that determines your performance? If it is it customer satisfaction surveys? how do you prefer to have your performance appraised? Just to give you an example of performance appraisal, so if you're a faculty member, so your instructors at Red Deer Polytechnic, here's how they are appraised. So we have peer observations, so that's a colleague observing an instructor in the classroom providing feedback. We have small group feedback, so maybe as a student you have given a feedback to a colleague of your instructor in terms of what's working and not working. You fill out student feedback instruments at the end of the semester in terms of what you like and don't like. And your instructors then take all that information and it goes not only to their boss, but they also reflect on that in a self-reflective report. So that written essay that we were talking about a minute ago. And then their manager writes a summative report having viewed all this feedback. To go from a more contract-based work or part-time work to more full-time permanent work, there's a review of your, what we call a continuous appointment portfolio. So this would be like uh, all the projects you've been involved in, all the feedback from the students is reviewed by a panel. We might also have uh, those 360 degree reviews where supervisors, subordinates, coworkers, customers, uh, I'll review your performance as well. So you can see here we have a number of different uh, performance appraisal methods for your instructors. But as you're thinking about your jobs, you know, how do you like to be appraised and what is the best method for appraising you? Uh, I was looking as I was preparing for this video. Right now what we're seeing as we're making this video is that uh, Twitter is laying off about half of their workforce this week. And there's rumors on Reddit that employees are being laid off who keep the employees who have written the most amount of code in the last couple of months, lay off the ones who haven't. And then what's happening is that then now they're realizing perhaps we laid off the wrong people and people are being contacted to rehire them back uh, after they were laid off because the performance appraisal method of how many lines of code you wrote 
maybe wasn't the best performance appraisal method. Because for example, if you are working on a particularly challenging problem, then that might mean a lot of time assessing what is already coded and trying to find the problems and the issues. And so your changes that you might make might be very small, but have a huge impact. And so it's not about rewriting the whole thing from scratch, it's about amending it. And so as we look at the performance appraisals, we go back to Stephen Kerr and say, okay, well, is the reward methods we're using, do those match the behaviors we want? And we go back to expectancy theory from Victor Vroom and say, okay, well, we wanted certain activities to take place, and then we want that to align to performance. So are we actually saying this is a good worker based on certain behaviors? And those we're saying have good performance, are we giving them the rewards? And are the rewards the things they want? So remember that there's all these pieces in terms of motivation. So if we go back to Victor Room, we need to make sure that we have, that we improve in expectancy. So that is the link between, right? So actually I'm just gonna go back in time, woo, real fast. Go back to those slides we talked about a while ago. Effort, does that turn into performance? So are we proving expectancy? Does performance match rewards? So are we improving our instrumentality? And then do our rewards match the individual goals? Are we improving valence? So if we look at our performance management system, we want a performance management system that rewards the effort that we want Okay, and gives rewards to those who are high performing. So that's what we're looking for as we look at our performance management system is the alignment here in terms of that expectancy theory. All right, let's woo, quickly go back. To all those slides we've already discussed. And so as we look at our performance appraisal, is it aligned with the effort we want? Does it align with the rewards that our employees want? So as we look at uh, performance, let's do a Pearson Revel self-assessment. So this self-assessment is supposed to help you identify obstacles you are experiencing or have experienced that prevent you from achieving a high level of performance. So as I was working through this particular uh, survey, I think the survey is actually incorrect. Uh, so let's go through it. And those of you who are doing the surveys along with us, maybe you can figure out uh, where I went wrong. But I did this survey twice. I did this survey once um, with my performance with what I will call a good boss and one I will call a bad boss. So. The bad boss is one where the expectations were not reasonable. So everybody was expected to be above average, uh, which isn't possible because an average is a collection of everyone's performance. Uh, and the what I felt like with that particular uh, boss is that based on the individual's personality, my personality, there was never going to be an alignment in terms of, of what they wanted uh, me to do and, and how they wanted me to behave. Whereas a good boss I found was very supportive and encouraging. Um, so let's look at the results to these. So what I find confusing in terms of this particular survey is when I answer the questions based on the good boss, I have insufficient um, factors to meet the specified level of performance. And when I have the bad boss, it says that I have sufficient uh, factors to maintain or increase the specified level of performance. I would say that those should be opposite. So when we look at this particular survey, it's looking at do you and your supervisor have a shared perception that your current performance needs to be improved? And so I guess where I think there's an error in this particular survey is that me and the bad boss had very different perceptions about my performance. So it doesn't quite make sense here that the bad boss would have a score of eight 
and the one with the good boss where we more agreed on what needed to be worked on and what didn't um, was a lower number. So I, I think there's a problem with this particular survey. The other piece you'll see in terms of difference is in performance-based incentives. So do we have uh, the appropriate incentives to motivate you to perform at your highest level with the good bosses at five, with the bad bosses at nine, which doesn't quite make sense because the issue with the bad boss um, is that there weren't the, the incentives to motivate um, to perform at the highest level. And in fact, working with the bad boss, we see active disengagement uh, with the employees because the expectations seemed to be unreasonable, didn't seem to align with um, how people felt uh, people should behave. Um, and, and so you can see those two pieces there. But separate from the fact that I think there's an issue with this survey, let's look at the survey seven components. So do you and your supervisor have a shared perception that your current performance needs to be improved? So really we're looking at, as we look at performance management, do we have this relationship with our employer where we can understand where each other is coming from in terms of do we have the same expectations in terms of the worker performance? We should have the same expectation. Do you have the ability, the required training to feel confident in your work? Right. So are you given the resources and the, the skills that you need? Um, do you have the necessary aptitudes to be successful in your work? So one is the resources, one is the talent. Do you have the requisite? So sorry, let's go to the three. If we go back to ability, remember ability is training, resources, and skills. So do we have the ability? Do we have the aptitude? Do we have the resources? Those are our training, resources, and skills in order to do the job. So I think that's why I think the survey is, is off a bit because it seems to have the numbers going the wrong direction for what it needs to be on this scale. So I think maybe this scale here is um, flipped. So do we have the ability? That's two, three, and four. And then remember performance is ability times motivation. So energy, direction, and persistence is the motivation piece. So here are you motivated to achieve the performance standards. So we break this down. We have our ability, that's components two, three, and four. We have motivation, that is component five. Combined, they make our performance. And then does the performance match in terms of now we're back to room and expectancy theory. Are there incentives to perform? And do you get the rewards that you want if you do perform? So we're actually looking at all these pieces now of all these things we've been discussing. Performance is ability times motivation, ability being training, rewards, and skills, motivation being energy, direction, and persistence. Combined makes the performance. And then does our effort lead to high performance? Does high performance lead to rewards? Do rewards lead to the rewards we actually want? So that's what it's trying to break down uh, with this particular survey, but I do think there's an issue here in terms of the scores seem to be to be a bit flipped. So so check it out and see if uh, see if you can rate better than I do. So when it comes to poor performance, what happens if we perform poorly? Well, we need to look at why is the employee performing poorly. Is it because they don't have the necessary training, resources, and skills? So is it a training issue, in which case we can provide them training? Is it a job mismatch? So they don't have the skills that are needed, and we need to put them into a different job. So we need to match them better in terms of the employee and the job. Or is it a motivation issue? So is it that the employee doesn't have the energy, the direction, the persistence. And then we go back to our motivation theories in terms of how do we create that motivation? So is it something that uh, the employee has lost his or her desire? Is there burnout? Um, how can we encourage the employee? So we go back to Skinner in terms of that positive and negative reinforcement. Can we give you things to motivate you? 
Can we reduce reduce burial barriers or hurdles to get you? Can we motivate you that way? Or do we need to take disciplinary action? So part of HR management is in terms of discipline. So what happens if the employee can't perform? You've given them the ability, but they're just not motivated. What do you do then? So is that then a, are they let go because of performance? Um, is there a dock in pay? How are you going to deal with that employee who doesn't have the appropriate motivation? So this particular survey from Pearson Revel looks at the way you prefer to discipline employees. So if you think about you having employees, how good are you at disciplining them for poor performance? So there are three general mistakes that people make when disciplining, laxness, overreactivity, and verbosity. So how do you deal with the employee that lacks motivation when you have the processes in place to motivate the employee and they're still not motivated. So we look at these three um, challenges here and which one do you suffer from more? So verbosity, when we look at verbosity, what we're talking about here is, is there too much discussion? You don't let it go, okay? or overreactivity. This is when people are stressed and then they redirect that stress towards other people. So you don't forgive and you take everything out on someone else. Or laxness. You don't follow through. You don't discipline or reprimand the employee with poor performance. You don't like conflict, so you just avoid it altogether. So which one do you tend uh, to be more uh, heavier on? So we need to be able to discipline poor performance. We need to have those tough conversations um, with employees, give them opportunities to improve. Okay. We need to not overreact, but we need to address the issues when they are there. And we, not, we need to not be over verbose uh, in terms of explain the issue, give them an opportunity to correct it. If the issue is outside of them, if it's a training issue, right, we need to do that. If it is a skills matching, their skills not matching the job, then maybe we made an error in hiring and we need to put them somewhere else. Is it something we have set up in our process that is not properly motivating people? in terms of that expectancy theory and alignment. Are we rewarding the behavior that we should be rewarding? Are we giving people the rewards that they want? So if it's not us, the business, and it's the employee, are you able to have those tough conversations and help them improve? As we look at employees, we also need to recognize and reward the positive behavior. So how do you go about doing that? Well, your organization may have open book management. So the idea here is that employees can see the impact of their decisions on the financial results of the organization because you've opened up the books of the organization. And so employees can see how the decisions, the performance they have impacts the bottom line. You may also have employee recognition programs. So providing personal attention for management uh, for great behavior, so you've gotten a new contract, you brought in a new client, recognition from the boss for that. Uh, you're exceptional in the job, you're the best uh, salesperson, recognition from the boss for that. Maybe we have pay for, for, for performance. This might be tied to the performance of the overall organization, so profit sharing, um, getting um, stock options, or it may be in terms of, of recognition awards, uh, for your accomplishments within your role. We're seeing more and more a gamification within organizations. So here we're using collaboration and competition to engage employees and we offer them prizes. So for example, many businesses are starting to do kind of walking competitions, make teams, you add up a total number of steps and whichever team has the most steps, you know, they walk the, climb whatever mountain or, or walk the most distance 
they get prizes. So we're encouraging certain behaviors within the organization. Here they might be in terms of mental or physical health. Uh, but we can also have gamification in terms of, of sales. You can have leaderboards where uh, you're comparing a different uh, who had the most sales, right? So then we're going back to, to Robert Owen uh, and Silent Monitor in terms of, of sharing publicly uh, how well individual performance is. We can reward people with professional development and training opportunities. Those who are part-time contracts can be rewarded with more permanent contracts. And we can also reward people uh, and recognize their work by having more flexibility. So maybe you can work from home, so more telework. Maybe there's a more flexible work schedule, so you don't have to work from nine to five. You can work at times that are convenient to you. Um, providing more autonomy to employees, to more flexibility, more work-life balance um, is a way to reward uh, performance as well.